Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be quadratic funding in Ethereum. I'd like to welcome Pia Mancini to the virtual stage to begin our session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, it's um, my pleasure today to introduce Vitaly to chat about uh, quadratic funding um, in the Ethereum community. Funding and sustaining our commons has been a traditionally difficult problem to solve, and it might be even harder when you try to do it coordinating a decentralized community. So here to, um, to talk about that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Vitalik. Thank you, and, and uh, great to be at this uh, wonderful event, um, event uh, in uh, virtual, uh, virtual form. I'm always uh, happy to talk, about, to talk about many things, and uh, kind of quadratic funding in particular has definitely been one of my uh, kind of big interests uh, for uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so, and I guess, uh, I'll probably just uh, put uh, put the slides on here. Just uh, give me one second. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, downloads. Mm, are you still with us? Yes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still here. I'm just uh, trying to uh, figure out exactly um, <laughs> how to take this uh, file and uh, um, move it over some other place. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry, this is confusing. My phone has a folder called downloads and a folder called download singular. And so I, uh, Need to just uh, hmm? what? No, virtual conferences are I've... not as easy as they seem. It, 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 it is definitely not. I'm okay on downloads. Um, I'm like, okay, copy to again. Okay, in the meantime, I think that um, we, if there's time uh, for questions mm -hmm. at the end, we're gonna take some questions. So make sure that you Sounds upload them good. or you have to upload them. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Okay, back. There it is. Yay! And I think I got it to work. Um, does uh, Does everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, I guess uh, so. Just to start off, I uh, kind of. I wanted to give a quick uh, kind of recap of what quadratic funding is. Uh, so quadratic funding is uh, this uh, mechanism that was uh, introduced by myself and uh, Glenn in uh, the uh, paper on uh, liberal radicalism a couple of years ago. And the purpose of the mechanism is basically to uh, kind of allocate funding toward kind of public goods, right? Public goods just basically meaning any kind of 
project that's uh, valuable to a large groups of people where you can't control uh, kind of who gets to uh, like if you create the thing you can't control who gets to use it and who doesn't uh, so um, things like for example the environment uh, scientific research uh, any kind of like book or uh, article kind of work of media uh, in many cases is a public good and public goods all, always uh, kind of suffer from this problem that they are uh, kind of underfunded like basically because the fact that you can't control uh, kind of who has access to something and who can't means that there's no kind of personal benefit to someone from uh, participating, uh, actually contributing money to a public good, except for uh, if they decide to donate, then uh, there's only this fairly tiny incentive because if you donate money to some public project, like you're kind of only slightly increasing uh, the probability that that project actually will be funded or slightly increasing the quality of that project. And so there is this kind of tragedy of the commons effect where any single person's contributions to a public good uh, kind of only uh, will benefit themselves along with a whole bunch of other people. But if people only take into account the benefits of themselves, then everyone ends up contributing kind of much less than they actually would. Right. And so quadratic finding is about basically a kind of compensating for this uh, tragedy of the commons effect by a kind of automatically allocating a, a pool of subsidies based on how much people contribute, right? So quadratic funding is interesting because it's uh, completely neutral in a certain sense. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of people have heard of quadratic voting, but one of the challenges with quadratic voting is that while uh, you, know, you have this kind of decentralized voting procedure on any particular issue, there is still this question of like, well, who gets to figure out what's on the ballot in the first place, right? And quadratic funding actually makes uh, even the question of what's on the ballot uh, sort of emergent and part of the mechanism in some sense. Uh, so the way that this works is basically anyone can spin up a project, anyone can contribute money to projects, and you have this kind of subsidy pool and the kind of the source of the subsidy pool isn't kind of specified by the mechanism. It could be a philanthropist, it could be kind of some kind of company that's overseeing some uh, uh, like e ecosystem, it could be a government, uh, it could be a lot of different things. And basically the way that the subsidy pool is used is according to this formula where you take uh, kind of everyone's uh, individual contributions, you take the square root of those con each of those contributions, you, you can calculate the sum of the square roots and then you calculate the square of the sum of the square roots. So in my little diagram on the slide here, and if the green squares are the contributions, the length of the squares are the square roots, and then and if the contributions themselves are the diagonals, but then if you take the square of the sum of the square roots, so that, that kind of gets expanded to this big kind of yellow square at where the yellow parts are this kind of extra subsidy money. And basically from the, uh, from the subsidy pool, you kind of add these extra, uh, extra amounts and any project that gets funded by more than one person will get subsidized to some extent and projects that have uh, more uh, contributions from more people will get uh, kind of disproportionately more subsidies. Uh, so in, in the liberal radicalism paper, there's a bunch of uh, kind of mathematical logic for why this is optimal. And I also wrote a blog post um, on uh, quadratic payments that's on uh, vitalica.ca where uh, you can uh, uh, kind of find another kind of uh, uh, simplified uh, kind of mathematical explanation for why this works. But uh, the, uh, the purpose uh, of uh, um, my talk today is basically that you know, quadratic finding is not just theoretical math anymore. Quadratic uh, finding is something that we actually uh, kind of implemented and uh, tried to make work in practice. Um, so just uh, to uh, kind of introduce uh, the uh, status quo before Gitcoin grants, right? So uh, Ethereum is the world's uh, second largest uh, kind of blockchain uh, or uh, public blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. And the Ethereum community, like all uh, blockchain communities, has many under -provi provided uh, public goods, right? So like online communities especially really suffer from this public goods problem uh, because 
basically everything is happening online. And so the, kind of the tools that people need to use, um, the uh, information that people need to kind of understand things better, pretty much everything that people need within the context of the Ethereum ecosystem, basically except for uh, kind of you know Ether and uh, the other tokens themselves, um, in many cases is a public good, right? Like basically, really kind of on offline, you know, you have a, a lot of uh, public goods, but you also have a lot of private goods. Because, but because you have physical objects, the physical objects can only be held by one person at a time, and so you can buy and sell and trade them. But online ecosystems, public goods become this kind of even big and even bigger concern. The status quo is that the uh, Ethereum Foundation is the main uh, fund allocator. And it has about a 30 million a year budget. It uses this to uh, support uh, a lot of uh, kind of research into things like cryptography, uh, development of uh, code, a kind of Ethereum client software, uh, certain kinds of applications, uh, just a lot of different things that are valuable to the ecosystem. In addition to the Ethereum Foundation, there are kind of wealthy ICO projects that launched on top of Ethereum and now have some of their own money that they use to allocate funds. Uh, whales, which is a, kind of a term that just means like wealthy um, holders of Ether, companies in the Ethereum ecosystem like Consensus. And the challenge basically is, well, can we make um, the funding sources uh, more diverse and uh, democratic, right? And the Ethereum uh, ecosystem is uh, one where, you know, people are already really into decentralization, uh, people, are interested in these ideas of like, let, you know, can we cooperate without uh, kind of centralized actors deciding everything? And so, um, like these ideas of uh, kind of quadratic funding and the uh, the radical exchange ideas, like really appeal very naturally to the Ethereum ecosystem. So, we uh, decided to try to do it. Uh, right. So, uh, Gitcoin, even from before Gitcoin grants, uh, it started. Uh, it started off uh, by uh, doing uh, kind of bounties for basically kind of small, small code development tasks uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem, but they then uh, kind of decided to, to try to expand by doing this uh, kind of pilot where they created this platform that's called Gitcoin Grants now that um, which uh, tries to do a kind of quadratic funding for Ethereum projects, right? So. Basically, anyone can kind of register, anyone can create a uh, project. Uh, so here I have uh, the uh, top 10 uh, winners for, I think it was the third round, uh, kind of the first round where things ended up being actually, started being actually interesting. So anyone can set up a project, anyone can uh, contribute to a project. And this uh, kind of quadratic funding subsidy formula is used to uh, kind of calculate basically how much donations get matched, right? So you see here, number one uh, uh, and number two, ETH Hub got about $4,700 in contributions and um, Austin Griff has got about 8,600, but the matching, um, ETH Hub got 16,000 and Austin uh, got about 15,000, right? Which basically shows that the amount of donations that ETH Hub and Austin got are about the same, or, or rather Austin is uh, considerably bigger, but, um, ETH Hub got contributions from uh, a yeah, wider and uh, kind of a more uh, diverse group of people. And the quadratic funding formula, kind of, it doesn't just count dollars, it also counts people. And so it ended, it ended up matching that more. Uh, so, so far we've had uh, kind of six rounds of uh, this kind of quadratic funding procedure. Uh, so in every round, basically the start of the round gets announced, uh, everyone, a sets up projects and people can contribute over a period of two weeks. Everyone uh, kind of uh, advertises their projects, everyone contributes. And at the end of the two weeks uh, and of the round closes and the subsidies are calculated based on this formula, right? So, uh, Gitcoin Grants um, has had uh, over $500,000 of matching funds and something like over a million dollars in uh, contributions elicited from the community, thousands of people participating, and it's been uh, kind of steadily doing this for over a year. Uh, so um, it started last year, uh, and, and I'm not even gonna talk about round one and round two because they were fairly small. Um, there were not that many people participating. The results weren't uh, kind of particularly good. 
But round one and round two did uh, kind of start introducing people to the mechanism. They and uh, did uh, kind of start giving people an, more of an idea of like, hey, what's actually going on here? And round three uh, is uh, this first round uh, that we had that actually had a, a very significant size, right? So uh, in round three, the uh, subsidy pot, I think it was a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars, and the uh, kind of uh, contributions, um, as we've seen, were uh, and it got some somewhere something like tens of thousands of uh, dollars of contributions, uh, and so you actually start seeing a lot of these uh, kind of really different and interesting projects uh, end up applying for uh, contributions, right? So what did we learn for Brown 3? Uh, so first of all, we were in this kind of boring but good result, which is that, at least in my opinion, the outcomes were broadly uh, kind of very reasonable, right? So uh, people chose projects. Uh, so like Ethereum client developer teams is one example. Uh, so you see a Prismatic and White House, uh, number three and five. Um, Ethereum scaling solutions, you saw Plasma Group at number 10, uh, developer tools, programming languages, uh, projects that try to uh, just kind of publish useful information about Ethereum, um, Austin Griffith, Ethereum developer that makes a whole bunch of uh, smaller things. So people chose projects that seem to be good and important to the Ethereum ecosystem, not a lot of wasteful projects. Um, people funded many projects that we did not even realize were important. Uh, developer tools, tools that make it easier to uh, interact with uh, specific kinds of applications. Um, even like Austin Griffith, for example, is someone who has been kind of doing a lot of, uh, a lot of good work that got recognized well by the community, but up until that point uh, probably wasn't uh, kind of supported uh, too much uh, by um, by the foundation and I think even like for my uh, for myself personally like I uh, did not even know Austin that well at this uh, uh, at this time I only kind of heard the name in passing and uh, it like the quadratic funding round like basically did uh, kind of call to, uh, to our attention uh, kind of the fact that Austin existed Austin was doing all of this uh, kind of great work for ethereum and that this is you know, someone that we should be basically paying more attention to. And so um, quadratic funding, not only did it uh, kind of fund the boring and obvious stuff, it also actually funded the uh, things that were not too obvious to us, but you know, in, in retrospect made a lot of sense. Um, and also the process uh, did uh, kind of help people basically feel more engaged in the community, right? So uh, the process uh, just, uh, by giving people the ability to uh, kind of contribute to projects, uh, have their contributions be matched, that got people thinking about, you know, what projects in the community are people doing that are valuable and that have been uh, kind of underfunded and uh, under supported by us. And it created this uh, kind of community dynamic engagement that uh, democratic decision making is uh, supposed to be about. So after round three, we have uh, round four. Uh, so in round four, we decided to do this kind of experiment where we split the round into two categories, where one round is uh, technology projects and the other round is media projects. And we renamed media to community now be, um, and because we and the word media didn't uh, kind of give quite the emphasis that we wanted to give. But basically tech is pretty obvious, it's tech, research software or anything like that and media is projects that try to inform people about ethereum uh, and provide information of different kinds and uh, newsletters uh, podcasts uh, youtube uh, kind of videos a, a whole bunch of different things um, so we wanted to just uh, kind of run quadratic funding rounds for these two categories separately and uh, kind of see what have uh, and especially uh, kind of uh, create a signal that you know Gitcoin grants isn't just for tech, uh, and that these uh, also very valuable media projects, and it will create an entire section for them, and uh, see and you know, see what happens inside of that section. So, what did we learn in round four? So round four is uh, probably the first round where things got kind of a really interesting in a spicy way. Uh, so on the tech side, 
and it was uh, kind of pretty boring in a good way, right? On the tech side, we just shot, we just saw continued contributions to these uh, kind of uncontroversially valuable projects. But on the media side, kind of uh, really interesting things started to happen, right? So uh, basically, one of the top recipients on the media side, uh, you can see number two, um, anti-pro synthesis, um, received uh, $11,000 in quadratic funding matching. And what this account is, is it's literally just someone who said, hey, I'm a Twitter account. I've been tweeting Ethereum things for a couple of years. Uh, donate money to support my tweeting. And at the time, like no one realized that, like, hey, you, know, you can earn $10,000 just for tweeting. And this person did, right? And a lot of people in the community made these uh, kind of independent decisions to support this person's tweets. And, uh, the, and they found his uh, kind of social media activity in a very important and valuable in terms of, uh, kind of uh, getting the Ethereum message out there in uh, kind of that, the, the particular way that he does. Uh, but at the same time, other people were upset at this, right? You know, there were a lot of other people that were saying things like, you know, this, oh, this team like worked uh, kind of really hard and made the, uh, put a lot of uh, kind of serious effort into making a newsletter or making a, some project that involves like really complicated cryptographic code involving zero knowledge proofs or something, something else. And here someone raised even more money than they did by tweeting. Uh, so basically, and here you can see kind of on the right, some examples of this kind of Twitter influencer. And so some just information about Ethereum, some th uh, things of the form, they're kind of just Ethereum is great, rah, rah, rah. Um, so a lot of uh, kind of fairly mixed content, right? So a lot of people in favor of him, uh, kind of a lot of people also, also opposed to him getting uh, uh, such a large share of the media pool. Um, so there were two uh, kind of major, uh, major criticisms here, right? So one of them is just that basically kind of does someone really deserve $10,000 for just tweeting? Uh, so one response to this is that uh, <clears throat> If you see the sh kind of the sheer volume of uh, the tweets that uh, that he made, and he clearly spent a lot of time on the tweets and work hard, has been doing it for years, and a lot of people did actually uh, kind of interpret quadratic fund the quadratic funding rounds as not just being a kind of rewards for work done in the last uh, two months uh, since since the previous rounds, but also as compensation for years of uh, work that has been uncompensated for like, British since at least uh, 2018. And the second response is just as kind of the free market argument, right? Well, hey, you know, a bunch of people found the tweets valuable enough uh, that they actually donated money themselves. Uh, so, you know, who are you to say that all these people are wrong when you didn't, when you didn't uh, kind of put your money where your mouth is yourself? And criticism two um, is interesting, right? So the criticism two is that these tweets might help in some ways, but they also might hurt in other ways, right? So if you kind of zoom in and look at the, some of these, like, some of them say things like, um, you know, Ethereum is unstoppable, or so yes, Bitcoin was a massive make -through, breakthrough, but we can only hope that it won't be the endpoint. And so there are people that uh, kind of criticize uh, some of the uh, some of the things uh, that uh, this account says as kind of being fa fairly aggressive in certain respects, and so basically um, there was this uh, kind of concern: you know, are there kind of negative uh, externalities that are uh, uh, here? And uh, quadratic funding by itself doesn't take into account negative externalities, right? Quadratic funding is all about taking into account positive externalities, and. In my blog post, I kind of originally talking about this round, I uh, kind of compared this to a very common theory of why markets are inefficient, which is basically that markets are especially inefficient when shorting is hard, right? So when you have uh, an ability to express a positive opinion on a stock, but not a negative opinion on a stock, then the price of a stock does not end up uh, reflecting the average of opinion of the stock price, it ends up reflecting the most optimistic opinions of uh, the, uh, the kind of the future stock price and the, and, uh, the uh, uh, future performance of that stock. And so the question is, well, might the same thing be happening here? <clears throat> so some people 
uh, kind of ac said that accused this account of like basically creating these negative externalities. Other people thought, thought that the account was great. And there's other people who probably thought that maybe that account deserved, you know, $4,000, but not $10,000. And so to kind of solve both those concerns and that, you know, are there kind of negative externalities that are being not taken into account? Um, and are, how do we let people express the idea that a project has kind of too much funding? You know, we've, uh, and the anti-pro synthesis wasn't the only uh, kind of accounts uh, that, uh, or uh, kind of in uh, round four that uh, led to these kinds of issues, but it was kind of one of the more obvious ones that kind of stood out to a lot of people. And so we attempt to kind of counteract this with a negative contribution mechanic, right? So in uh, quadratic funding, you know, you basically take kind of the square root of uh, everyone's uh, contributions, you add up these square roots. Um, and <clears throat> if you remember uh, kind of ma learning math, you'll remember that every number actually has two square roots. It has a positive square root and a negative square root. So the question is, well, what happens if you let people choose to have their contribution represent a negative uh, square root instead of the positive square root, right? So basically, if, if you take the analogy between quadratic fighting and quadratic voting, instead of just being able to vote for a project, you can now also vote against the project. And so we attempt to introduce this mechanic where you can make a contribution, have it count negatively, and see what happens. Um, so I'll get, I'll get what does happen, and we'll see, and I'll get to this a bit after. Um, one third really interesting thing that we discovered in round four, right, is that first, the quadratic funding round is kind of called an Ethereum quadratic funding round, that it's theoretically a quadratic funding round kind of for the Ethereum ecosystem. But nothing in the quadratic funding rules actually privileges Ethereum projects over other projects, right? And even in the original quadratic funding paper, it was described as a kind of formal rules for a society neutral among communities, right? The quadratic funding rules really are neutral. Anyone can spin up a project, anyone can donate, all the donation projects that get multiple donations get subsidized. And so what happens when a project uh, outside of the Ethereum ecosystem uh, kind of support uh, starts uh, participating. And here we actually saw someone basically saying, hey, I'm a Twitter influencer too, except I'm a Twitter influencer for Ethereum Classic. Um, and Ethereum Classic is this kind of, and sometimes you consider this kind of little brother to Ethereum. It's uh, this uh, blockchain that sort of forked off from the main Ethereum chain when uh, the DAO fork, uh, this kind of controversial event in Ethereum history, happened about four years ago. Uh, so uh, Yasinator here is, a, he is someone who loves Ethereum Classic and is a Twitter influencer for Ethereum Classic. And he started accepting contributions. In this case, uh, he only got, like, I think it was six contributions, still got, but he still got $38 uh, dollars of matching funding from a matching pool that was theoretically intended to be an Ethereum matching pool. And so, the question that this raises is basically, you know, do we need centralized uh, kind of filtering to basically determine what is an Ethereum project and what isn't? Um, might this be another use case of uh, kind of negative contributions where if uh, <clears throat> this is supposed to be for the Ethereum community, then as long as the quadratic funding is kind of mostly um, done by the Ethereum community, then could the Ethereum community just uh, kind of basically just provide negative votes against uh, any project uh, that it considers to be sort of off topic? Uh, would you want centralized moderation of some kind? Uh, would you want some other kind of DAO, some other distributed process for determining what is a real Ethereum project? Whatever this procedure is, could that procedure be abused? So uh, I don't, we don't really have good answers for this yet. And I think so far, there's definitely been some centralized curation going on, especially in terms of figuring out like what goes in the media section, what goes in the tech section. Um, so do we have claim to have solutions better than uh, centralized curation? Uh, probably not yet, uh, but no, this is one of those uh, kind of challenges on the frontier of the mechanism, right? Like this kind of mismatch between the universality of quadratic funding in theory versus the fact that kind of the existing funding sources for matching funds do wants to support specific communities. So now we have round five.
Uh, so round five kept the tech and media format. Round five did introduce uh, negative contributions, but we saw a negative result, right? So uh, negative contributions ended up being used very little. Uh, so there's maybe like it was about 10 of them versus like thousands of positive contributions or something like that. And the few times it did, people were very upset, right? So one piece of uh, kind of feedback that we got just kind of summarizing a lot of people's opinions into one sentence is like kind of being downvoted makes me feel terrible. Gitcoin grants is supposed to be about a spirit of positivity, of uh, giving people the ability to basically rip money out of each other's pockets, uh, kind of really um, kind of ruins that mechanic. And so it ended up not being very effective, right? And so what do we learn from this, right? So one um, takeaway might be like, well, don't do this, ne this uh, negative contribution thing. But the reality is that there is still an unsolved problem here, right? So the problem is that, you know, theoretically, some project, there are projects that have negative externalities and there are projects that are really overrated by a small community. Um, and there's no good way of uh, kind of dealing with this, right? So in this particular case, like it seems like there weren't actually that many people that were uh, kind of upset with um, anti pro synthesis enough to uh, try to take money away from him. Uh, so, you know, I guess, uh, you know, he can rest easy and uh, knowing that he is not in fact uh, kind of widely uh, uh, condemned by the Ethereum community as a, uh, as a bearer of, a neg of negative externalities and uh, that there's kind of, people are mostly appreciative of his work, but, or you could uh, kind of conclude that people are just very wary of giving negative uh, kind of contributions in general. Um, and there's also the question of, well, maybe negative, like, uh, negative contributions should exist, but they shouldn't uh, kind of be visible. Um, so you shouldn't be able to see that you got a neg negative contributions that you should just see the total at the end. Um, but regardless of, uh, kind of which path you end up taking, like, there, I, I do think that quadratic funding is going to have to have some kind of mechanism for dealing with uh, kind of projects uh, that have negative effects, right? Like, you know, and you know, like what kinds of uh, trolls there exi uh, exist on the internet and people who uh, kind of believe and promote also uh, kind of all sorts of positions that uh, kind of people making a quadratic, uh, uh, providing a kind of quadratic funding um, would uh, kind of really not wants to uh, not wants to promote uh, and dealing with uh, kind of those kinds of projects that have these kinds of mixed positive and negative or even uh, effects is something that quadratic funding at present uh, isn't really doing a good job of and so you know we have to figure or kind of keep iterating on this and figure out something better. Um, Stability of income, uh, a concern in round five. Uh, so project revenue often kind of goes up and down by a factor of two or four or more between rounds. And if we want quadratic funding to be a mechanism that actually funds people's livelihoods, then you know we need uh, kind of contributions to be more stable. Um, and in round six, we did some uh, kind of innovations to try to address that. In round five, we also started to see some uh, kind of collusion and some fake accounts. Uh, to try to basically send a bunch of contributions from different fake accounts to try to get more, uh, kind of fraudulently get more matching funding. So in round six, so we focused on both of those problems. <clears throat> so we added a, a kind of add to cart interface, make it easy to uh, kind of make uh, a lot of uh, co contributions. We added a functionality that just says, repeat the contributions you made in the last round. Uh, we added a mechanism where one third of the contributions in the last round automatically kind of become uh, calculated as part of the matching pool. And we added a kind of optional phone number verification for higher matching to um, as uh, a kind of stronger anti civil mechanism than, uh, than the thing that we had before, which was GitHub accounts. Uh, so we added those things and uh, unfortunately round six is still in progress. But you know, general conclusions, right? So, I, mean, I think the first conclusion is uh, that we had is that kind of in broad strokes, quadratic funding works. Uh, so, quadratic funding was 
actually was successful, able to fund all, uh, or choose interesting projects to fund and choose projects that deserves to get funded. Uh, and it's uh, did uh, kind of a lot of, uh, kind of, well, it generated a lot of community engagement. Um, also, if you're going to do quadratic funding yourself, don't be discouraged if round one goes poorly. Um, quadratic funding gets better over time, and so it often takes at least until round three or four before people uh, kind of really get into the groove of uh, kind of how to participate. Um, not just the economics, but also the social properties of a mechanism are important, right? How does the mechanism make people feel? Kind of what kind of uh, of community dynamics uh, does the mechanism create? Does the mechanism help people feel more engaged? Um, also, quadratic funding is not just valuable as a direct funding allocator, it's also valuable as a signal, right? If a project got $10,000 of matching on uh, Gitcoin grants, that also is a signal that shows that, hey, this is actually a project that lots of people in the community find valuable. And that information is, is useful in a lot of ways, and it uh, helps to kind of inform the Ethereum Foundation's own funding of priorities to a certain extent. It's helped to kind of inform our opinions of just what is what are things that people feel are really important. Uh, so, quadratic funding isn't just about uh, kind of allocating money to projects in the here and now. It also is about um, all, all of these other things. Um, in another, th so. You know, there's still uh, kind of a, lot, a fairly big uh, kind of frontier to uh, explore here. Um, there's still a lot of kind of tweaks to the mechanism that you can make. And also kind of the psychology and the sociology around the mechanism is something that's really worth analyzing. Like uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of very counterintuitive psychology that happens around, you know, what happens if you kind of give people money for doing particular things. And if you give people money that's, <clears throat> kind of comes as a, a result of a quadratic funding reward. Does that end up kind of feeling different to getting a grant from some uh, kind of centralized organization? Uh, so there's still a lot of those kinds of issues that's, uh, that's also worth uh, kind of learning and trying to understand uh, better as well. Uh, so we hope to see uh, quadratic funding uh, kind of get deployed in more and a larger scale context. And I think the Ethereum ecosystem was this interesting test bed because the Ethereum community is this community that's both really interested in quadratic funding and also it is large enough that it has a kind of internal disagreements, uh, internal tribal dynamics to some extent, um, kind of actual uh, kind of internal stresses that make it uh, are going to that create kind of real world scale challenges to uh, deploying okay. something like this. That create kind so, of real world scale you know, challenges. we hope that. Uh, quadratic funding can be continued to be used, not just in Ethereum, but also in um, other places as well. Um, thank you. That is um, fascinating. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and there's some questions here also um, from the um, folks watching this, but what other public goods do you think quadratic funding is um, it's a good mechanism to fund? Um, do you think that we can, um, citizens can kind of allocate, decide how to allocate part of their taxes uh, using a quadratic funding mechanism? Um, what public goods do you, do you think um, can be funding by something like this? And what public goods do you think that maybe mm -hmm. just cannot be funding, funded by quadratic funding? So one uh, kind of very natural target um, in a uh, kind of a more mainstream political context would be local news media. Uh, so like in general, kind of journalism and media is something that like, it's one of those really challenging things uh, kind of institutionally because both the market and the government uh, ways of funding media are just terrible in different ways, right? Like the market uh, kind of just people just pay money approach is terrible because uh, you know, it is a public good, it is going to get underfunded, and it creates these uh, kind of really terrible incentives to kind of optimize for clicks and all these other things. And I mean, media being government funded is obviously kind of terrible for reasons that are kind of fairly obvious as well. Um, and so quadratic funding allows you to potentially fund uh, kind of journalism in ways that both uh, get around the tragedy of the commons without also 
creating this uh, kind of centralized authority that has kind of like basically a, a, a huge amount of power over like what things people end up hearing. Uh, so that's one very natural target. Um, another um, target, I, uh, this is this was uh, kind of suggested to me uh, in the context of a, conver uh, a conversation I uh, had with uh, kind of Palladium people a couple of days uh, days back um, is that um, some European countries um, they have uh, kind of this concept of either a church tax or some kind of tax that has a kind of very limited uh, like tax choice. So I know like Italy has this uh, kind of auto per mille as uh, the kind of the original name for it, it's a kind of eight per thousand of uh, your income, where you have a kind of this very limited amount of choice in, uh, like you can send it to either a church or some kind of secular organization. Uh, so there are these uh, kind of European countries that have a tradition of like basically saying there's some portion of your a small uh, of your taxes where you can choose uh, kind of within balance of uh, basically who the recipient is, and so. Uh, quadratic funding could potentially be a kind of interesting alternative to uh, those kind uh, to those kinds of schemes. So, like basically, instead of being a, a kind of choice between three organizations, it could be a, a, a kind of funding going to a quadratic matching pool. And then th at that point, it's kind of a national scale thing, and so it would be people could use it for potentially everything. Um, also, uh, other kind of eco ecosystem, like video game ecosystems, might be one uh, kind of potential uh, kind of adopter of uh, quadratic funding. Uh, so, and it really could be pretty much everything. But I mean, the uh, well, the one things that don't really make sense, I would say, are what I call a kind of entrepreneurial public goods. Uh, so, public goods where they are public, but uh, and they are good, but people don't kind of recognize that they're that, that they're important immediately. Uh, so, kind of the basically the public good equivalent of venture capital, right? So, like in the startup world, you know, you have venture capital that's theoretically for kind of identifying startups, creating private goods that are mm -hmm. not highly valued now, but will be highly valued ten years from now. And quadratic funding by itself is not like it. It doesn't really kind of reward like reward predictive power in the way that venture capital does and so it's not going to be good at like identifying things that people are going to consider to be really valuable in 2040 and so mm -hmm. like the question of like how to actually kind of provide those kinds of things is something that we still don't really have good mechanisms for you know could you co per combine quadratic funding and prediction markets would you have to do something else still a lot of open area to explore yeah, that's fascinating. In my experience with um, op, like supporting and sustaining open source ecosystems, um, one of the, the the things that crowdfunding that I've seen with crowdfunding um, sustainability of open source projects is like it can turn into a little bit of a popularity contest, right? And so a lot of like core plumbing infrastructure that's boring and it's not as appealing normally gets kind of left on the side or has less fund crowdfunding than the most kind of hot popular yeah. kind of latest mm -hmm. whatever framework um mm -hmm. so i think that i am particularly interested in sort of the not only the, the negative kind of um voting mm -hmm. but also if you are thinking about how to compensate um for mm -hmm. projects that are core or base but are maybe mm -hmm. less popular because they're less yeah like sure popular yeah no i think that's uh, kind of a very good point as well and i think there's two uh, kind of answers to this one answer is kind of within quadratic funding right like in like in a kind of private goods economy when you have like a lot of different tasks that kind of has to be bundled together and you don't want people to kind of pay for the tasks individually generally what people do is they form a company right and customers pay money to the company and the company hires employees and the company has some kind of an of internal governance to basically figure out like what are the the kind of the, the things that need to be done and like how much to compensate people for it and so like this idea that you can have kind of companies that people can form their own units that uh, uh, consisting of multiple people um, and that it's these kind of packages that participate in, in the wider mechanism. And so you kind of bundle together things that would not get uh, kind of compensated by themselves, I think is uh, kind of something that can be moved into a uh, kind of quadratic funding context as well, right? And it already has been. Uh, so for example, uh, in the Gitcoin rounds, 
one of the recipients that you saw even in round three was these Ethereum client developer teams. So there was a Prismatic and White House and a couple of others. And those are companies, right? Those are collections of people, you know, they have developers, they hire janitors, um, they, uh, you know, hire people who do all sorts of things, right? So you, if uh, you uh, kind of abstract things out and say, uh, like basically kind of bundle together the kind of unsexy but necessary things with uh, kind of sexier things, then potentially can get around it within quadratic funding. So that's one answer. Another answer is that you can say that, you know, quadratic funding is definitely not <clears throat> a kind of master mechanism that's uh, going to solve every problem. And in general, you know, any mechanism for funding public goods is going to uh, kind of is going to leave a lot of things uh, uh, underfunded or unfunded. Um, and you know, you have quadratic funding, and then we have uh, kind of technocratic funding by the Ethereum Foundation, and then we have a whole bunch of different individual uh, kind of contributions. <coughs> And then you have people just working for free and getting recognition by the community for it. So you do have a lot of these different mechanisms that can partially fund public goods and that, but that do kind of each individual, you kind of leave a lot of holes. And so the idea is that maybe we don't want to have one mechanism that handles everything. Maybe we do just want to have these kind of overlapping uh, tech mechanisms that have different strengths and weaknesses so they can compensate for each other. Yeah. Um, I just I want to make sure I touch upon this because there's a couple of questions on this area and also I'm interested particularly on this. Um, quadratic funding is sitting at kind of the intersection of voting and markets, right? Um, or it's like a combination, if you want, of both. And it places like most of the power on individual community signaling, right? A lot of people signaling support for a project gets more funding than, you know, just someone putting more money on a project. So. At the same time, this mechanism, well, it corrects for a lot of the um, problems that we have in funding um, our commons. It also puts a prime on humanity fraud, right? Which is something that I think you touched upon. Um, so voting obviously requires proof of identity that is very easily solved in centralized um, communities or, or, or centralization models. Like, how important is for you um, proof of humanity for funding public goods in decentralized communities? Um, what's, what have you been seeing in the space that is interesting? What's your, your vision for how should we be mm -hmm. thinking about formalizing humans, essentially? Yeah, no, very good question. And I think we definitely have had uh, kind of attempts at uh, creating decentralized unique human systems. Uh, so Bright Idea is one of the projects that's doing this in the Ethereum ecosystem. There's uh, a few others as well. There's Pope, the uh, proof of attendance protocol. Um, so we do have uh, other people that are trying to solve this problem that are taking a few different approaches. Um, and then obviously right now, Gitcoin Grants is taking this kind of relatively centralized route. My general uh, kind of instinct is still that kind of quadratic, like the identity part of quadratic funding is still is, is a reason why I expect quadratic funding to, at least in the short and medium term, continue to kind of work better in smaller communities than as uh, some kind of global thing. Like basically the more global you go, the more, I got the easier identity fraud potentially becomes and the harder it is to police. And like, if you go, go into like extremely kind of big scales, like uh, there does come a, a point at which uh, it does just start becoming really hard to police, right? Like even government issued identities are something that is definitely something that can, like people can defraud, people can sell, um, you know, you definitely can like just, go up to poor to kind of poor people and say i'll give you a thousand dollars if you just uh, give me your passport and pretend i stole it from you um and if you start creating a kind of monetary incentive on uh, doing all of those things then you know this sort of stuff will happen um so i yeah I, my general instinct is basically that like it's good that it's being tried in smaller ecosystems where it's it is easier to kind of police for these kinds of issues and we'll just kind of keep scaling up and we'll just keep uh, kind of uh, dealing with uh, the issues as they come over time. Um, I have to say, Vitalik, that it's very inspiring to see how the community is protecting itself um, here in the sense that 
um, always when you try to, when you innovate, when you propose new governance mm -hmm. mechanisms or systems, like everyone expects the new thing to completely replace whatever was there and to work well. Um, and that's mm -hmm. so unfair on innovation because it can stifle innovation, right? Because it's never going to be perfect and it's never going to replace everything. And, and we need to learn through experience. So um, I think, yeah, that's a very inspiring approach that I think you all are taking. Um, on that note, I think our time is up. Um, we are, uh, yeah. Um, so thank you for uh, your presentation. And yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you.